Welcome back to the Pacific Century, a Hoover Institution podcast on China, America, and the fate of the Indo-Pacific in the 21st century. Uh, I am Misha Oslin, your host. It's been a while. Uh, we've been on a bit of a, uh, a hiatus, uh, though there's been a lot going on and we've been keeping our eyes on it, but we're happy to welcome you to a special midsummer edition of the Pacific Century, and we are particularly pleased to have as our guest, Admiral Sir Ben Key, the first Sea Lord of the Royal Navy. Now, longtime listeners may remember that we had Admiral Key's predecessor, Admiral Sir Tony Radican, uh, the first Sea Lord uh, a few years ago, and, and Admiral Radican has now become Chief of the Defense Staff, the, the senior uniformed officer in the uh, British Armed Forces, and Admiral Sir Ben Key has replaced him. Uh, so we are thrilled to be able to have an update on uh, things that have happened since we last talked to the Royal Navy and about the Royal Navy uh, broadly, but also in the Indo-Pacific. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the first Sea Lord, uh, Admiral Sir Ben Key, uh, he joined the Royal Navy in 1984. Uh, he studied physics at the Royal Holloway, uh, at Royal Holloway, which is part of the University of London. Uh, he has commanded various ships in the Royal Navy, but perhaps most uh, significantly, he was commander of one of Britain's aircraft carriers, HMS Illustrious, uh, and then has worked at key staff positions uh, and has also been involved in Britain's military activities uh, in Afghanistan uh, and, of course, uh, has experience around the world, including in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, he became First Sea Lord uh, on, uh, in November of 2021, so it's about a year and a half, and we are thrilled to have him join us. And welcome to the Pacific Century First Sea Lord. Thank you very much. Great to be have the opportunity to join you. Well, sir, thanks so much for taking time. And uh, uh, you are, I should say, the second First Sea Lord, not the second Sea Lord, which there is one, but the second First Sea Lord to join us on the Pacific Century. Uh, Admiral Radikin, uh, your predecessor, who now heads up the defense staff, the, the top uniform position uh, in the UK, joined us a few years ago, and, and we had a great conversation. But there's a lot that's actually changed yeah. since then. And I'd like, I'd like to get to that, I think you've inherited uh, a lot of pieces that were beginning to move when he joined us. Um, but before we get into any of the specifics, um, we always like to to let the audience um, uh, get to know you a little bit uh, and ask, um, how did you get to become the first Sea Lord? How did you get into the Navy? Are you from a naval family? Was this a, a dream to, to span the oceans or was it all serendipity? I think the 18-year-old Ben Key would be rather surprised if he knew that um, a decision to join the Navy for a few years whilst I worked out what I was going to do with my life actually turned into the only career I have had for now in my 39th year. Wow. And, um, in, you know, my, my, my maternal grandfather served in the Navy for many years. He, he, you know, he effectively went to the Royal Naval College Dartmouth when it was a when it was a school, so he went at the age of 13. Um, he was mobilized from there at the age of 16 when the First World War began. Wow. Fought at the Battle of Jutland as a 17 and a half year old in HMS Collingwood. Oh, that's some history. That's that's amazing. Well, he served he served in the ship with um, the then uh, His Royal Highness, the Duke of York, who went on to become King George VI uh, during the Second World War. So um, there's kind of a, you know, a, a connection there um uh, that you know it endured for the rest of their lives as i think you know if you fought alongside someone as a as a young person um you kind of stay in touch not necessarily closely but they kind of they stayed in touch until the king died um yeah. and so i was always had this influence of my my grandfather who was an you know an engineer captain um but i didn't grow up anywhere near the sea I, I didn't grow up learning how to sail dinghies or anything like this. And it was just that when I was 18, my parents were uh, living um, in Australia. And we might touch on my kind of Pacific connections. Absolutely. Uh, and I needed someone to help fund my way through university, a something that, a, a, you know, a challenge that would be well known to many of your listeners. Yes. And at the time, at the time, the Royal Navy were, and the, the Army and the Air Force were, offering kind of scholarships 
uh, in support cadetships. And um, I opted for the naval one, I, I think, on the basis that that was the service I I knew the least most about or the most least about. I'd been an army cadet at school, but it, you know, so I knew I enjoyed military life. Hmm. Um, and I thought, well, I'll do that for five or six years, having got my degree. And, and by then I'll have given myself some shape as to what I really want to do. And, and the answer actually became, you know, providentially, I landed in the career that was to shape. And I never, it never occurred to me to leave. I just forgot to have that conversation with myself. <laughs> well, I guess there's still time eventually. <laughs> to do no, that. I, so, no, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, I'm not the only person who joins the Navy out of sort of slightly idle curiosity and then finds it's a great place. The value sets, the sense of community. Um, I really enjoyed life on board a ship at sea. That was, you know, really important. But I wouldn't say it was because I really, really have to be at sea. I don't own a yacht. I can't think of anything worse than getting back from a six month deployment and going sailing again. You've just been looking at the stuff. I mean, I'm quite. I have learned now how to sail because I don't go to sea very often. But, but in you know, in my earlier life, I couldn't understand my colleagues who got back from a long deployment and were just talking about pushing their yacht down the slipway and going back out there. I'd rather run up a mountain. So, <laughs> you know, that's what it. And but then the career has just provided a whole range of challenge, professional challenges, personal experiences. Um, opportunities that I've I've relished and and I suppose in enjoying them you sort of tend to be okay at doing them and that just keeps you moving up the system so I've, I've been very lucky. Well, I'm glad you cleared up one uh, one question I, I had, which is reading the Patrick O'Brien novels. I, I couldn't understand why Jack Aubrey wanted a a home in the country. I, I would have assumed he wanted to be on the sea, but no, he has a country estate. And I thought, well, that does that ring true? And I think you've just you've just put another data point to the fact that the Patrick O'Brien novels are brilliant and 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 as close to life as possible. Um, let me let me ask though, I just wanted to to check. So when you when you joined, uh, you were commissioned. You 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 didn't you weren't enlisted. You didn't have the enlisted uh, experience in the Navy, did no, you? No, I joined I joined as an eighteen year old midshipman. Did my mm -hmm. uh, did my initial training at the Naval College, uh, Dartmouth, which uh, unlike uh, Annapolis is not does not offer a multi year degree program. It's a you know it's a number of months contained within twelve. Um, left from there, joined the fleet as a midshipman ensign for a few months, and then from there went to university. So I sort of did did it the other way round to how a lot do it today. And then during my three years at university, which was just, it was part of London, one of the colleges in London University, um, in my summers, I was then required to go back to sea to sort of maintain my currency. And then once I'd graduated, I then, you know, picked up, picked up, finished my training and, and resumed. And the idea of that program, and, you know, we're going back to the 1980s now, was to bring more graduate um graduates into the non-technical branches of the navy so i'm a you know i'm a, a warfare officer by background um and so it was just to create these opportunities to try and pull more people in um uh, and the way to do it was to sponsor them so that you you know you're kind of you had a bit more money than your average student basically because you were still being paid albeit as a reduced salary Right. And uh, no, it it worked very well, and my and my tuition fees were met, and that was a that was a key key element. Of the, Absolutely, um, of, of the endeavor, no question. So, before we get to the serious stuff, let me let me ask you, uh, just because I don't want to forget it at the end. Um, what has been the most? What's your most memorable Royal Navy experience? Um, you know, was it almost getting washed off board? Was it a sunset on, you know, in Bali? What What's the most memorable that just, you know, that when you look back and those are the ones you want to keep with you, what is it? Oh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, some of them are memorable, but not necessarily. So, you know, I've been very lucky to survive a helicopter ditching. Oh, wow. That's memorable, but perhaps not for the right reasons. Right. Um, but that means that um, I'm a member of uh, the Goldfish Club, uh, for which one of the former presidents of the United States is also eligible for membership. Uh, the first President Bush, Bush, I assume you're talking. Yep. Yes. And uh, he was awarded honorary membership of the Goldfish Club. It's a, it's a club that you never set out to join, 
Uh, but, but you become eligible for membership. And actually, what you find is that some of the people who are, who are you know, they tend to be military, but not all uh, military aviators, because anyone who ditches in the water is eligible to join. But some of the stories right. of the aviation during the Second World War in the early years after that, when they were, you know, really quite, shall we say that aviation safety wasn't as profound as it is today. A lot of it was really innovative engineering, you know, the, the rate of change and development of, of, of aircraft from aircraft carriers in particular, um, and then the arrival of those sort of early helicopters, all of that. You find that the men and women who were involved in that sort of aviation had phenomenal stories to tell, or you would find out about those who had ditched and spent, you know, two or three days in a life raft in really cold conditions, not quite sure whether they were going to be picked up by their own side or the other side and things like that. So it was always humbling to go to those reunions. Um, whereas we we ditched in a part of the world where the water was warm and the ship wasn't that <laughs> far away. So, <laughs> But anyway, um, so that, that would be it. No, I think my, I mean, command is always you know, one of the great privileges and obligations. And I think the the bits that I've felt have been the greatest memories for me is when you're part of an organization or a team that has done something and you realize that kind of you've set a, as the, as the, as the commander, you've set a direction of travel. And then this amazing group of men and women have kind of turned that into something and made something of an opportunity or an obligation often under you know, considerable pressure or requiring real innovation. And when you're part of that, um, then that really feels quite special. And it's those things I think that that I will always that I that I will that I'll take the the you know the most satisfaction from. And that's not not because it was my wisdom in command. It was it was the delight at seeing the things that I kind of thought might be a good idea turned into something really because of the people that did it. You know, being part of the sorts of teams. Um, yeah, that's great. And I've been a couple of those. Anyway, well, I, I appreciate that. And um, I think it, it would be helpful before we get again to to the Asia part, maybe if, if you could do a really sort of brief 101 on the Royal Navy for our listeners, some of whom may have heard uh, when Admiral Radican came on, and I think I think I asked him the same question. But, um, you know, were you especially those of us in Washington, you know, it's it's a sort of skewed data set of thinking about the U.S. Navy and thinking about its size and, and its role, even if, uh, you know, there's a, a robust argument on whether its size is enough. It certainly dwarfs most of the other navies. And that's something that Americans have been so used to for so long that they don't really think about a lot of the trade-offs, the questions, um, the, the the difficulties in many ways of, of operating globally as you do, but but with a, a smaller force. And so maybe if you wouldn't mind just just sort of walking us through, if as if we were you know parliamentarians asking you know what why do you need this? What does the Royal Navy look like today? What the, the number of your capital ships, the number of the the, uh, the number of of um, uh, those both in uniform as well as on shore, uh, the, the the bases you have around the world. Just give us a, a one-on-one if you could, and then and then we'll move over to the Pacific. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, I, you know, I would say this anyway, but I think the Royal Navy tries to be, um, you know, profound value for money for the British taxpayer and, and as, you know, one of the leading navies in the world. And I say that not based upon our size, um, you know, I'm curious that you say, you know, the U.S. Navy now has this factor of size. You know, I come from a Navy where 150 years ago, the basic policy was the Royal Navy was to be the size of the next two biggest navies combined. That was the benchmark by which, you know, we were and, and you know, not surprisingly, therefore, we were disproportionately large and and the nation couldn't mm -hmm. afford that uh, going through. But what I take enormous pride of is that we're one of the very few navies in the world that covers the range of um, major maritime capabilities we do so and we offer both conventional and nuclear strategic deterrence capabilities so at the heart of the fleet clearly are the four uh, strategic missile carrying submarines which carry the trident missile system um and they uh they then uh take with them uh an another seven ssns so we're a nuclear operating navy that operates uh an independent nuclear deterrent uh very closely shared with the us through you know extraordinary 
uh, treaties through the 19, you know, set in the 1950s and the 1960s around the mutual defence um, agreement and then the Polaris Sales Agreement. And we might come back to that in the context of what's happened in the Pacific now. Uh, we're the only Navy in the world that operates two aircraft carriers specifically designed to to support the F-35, a fifth generation aircraft. And I say that with all due respect to the USS Gerald R. Ford, which is at sea today, but that's an evolution of a design that's been going on for many years, whereas we we were essentially given a blank piece of paper to start again. So that's HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales. And then, uh, and then supporting that, we have a range of destroyers and frigates um, uh, providing, you know, the kind of standard escort force, but also able to operate on their own across NATO or other ind individual partnerships. And then a series of smaller offshore patrol vessels, which actually are globally deployed, including two that we keep uh, permanently operating across the um, Indo-Pacific region, uh, which we'll come back to. Not big, only 90 metres long, but they're on five-year deployments into the region. And so that allows us to achieve you know, a considerable number of kind of linkages and and for us to, you know, regrow some of our kind of operating partnerships in a part of the world we used to know very well, but have tended over the last few decades to 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 not be involved with quite so much. And then, you know, we clearly operate our own organic aviation. But the other thing I'm tremendously proud of is that within the Navy sit the Royal Marines. So they're not a separate service. Uh, they're definitely not part of the Army. They're part of the Royal Navy. And, and they, they bring with them all of that considerable history and partnership and really give us our literal strike capability. So we offer these three kind of three main pillars around the continuous at sea deterrent, which is the nuclear aspects, and then carrier strike and literal strike with the supporting enablement. We, we operate out of um, three naval bases in a dockyard around the UK, plus you know uh, air stations and commando bases. Uh, we don't have any Navy-only bases that we own around the world, though clearly we have permanent presence uh, in the Falklands, uh, in Bahrain, uh, and, and, and one or two other places such as that. Um, but actually, the great thing that we've done in the last few years, particularly reflecting the government's uh, Indo-Pacific tilt, as it gets called, is that in the last... Um, in the last 18 months, we, we've operated with confidence across every line of longitude and in both polar oceans. So we've, we've definitely gone back to not just a Navy that can operate globally, but one that is operating globally. Uh, the carrier strike group deployment in 2021 uh, into the Indo-Pacific region, of which uh, the US Marine Corps put a squadron of F-35 and, and, and also the US Navy, uh, um, uh, one of their destroyers, uh, the Sullivans, you know, that was that first kind of major reach back into the region. And and as recently be announced, we'll be doing another major deployment into the region in 2025, plus raising our levels of presence. So the, the joy for me is that I see a, a Navy that is going back to operating globally. Clearly, the Euro-Atlantic is our principal area of activity, and NATO remains at the bedrock of of, of everything we do, uh, but we're not constrained to that. We recognize we have a number of global partnerships in a world that is globally connected, and we'll probably explore some of that as we move on. And sorry, in the final bit, so we're about 36,000 in total. That's about 30,000 sailors and marines, 3,000 uh, reserves, and then uh, about 3,000 uh, brilliant civil servants who are part of the Navy. Uh, and then clearly there's the broader industrial partnerships without which we would not be able to do our business. Well, you mentioned the, uh, uh, and, and rightfully starting off uh, with the illustrious history of the Royal Navy and, and its size and and outsized influence uh, on the world. And, and as you point out, coming back to that operating around the world, but you have, you have this such an interesting mix, right, in terms of uh, the nuclear capability, aircraft capability, and then the the, the sort of more standard capabilities that many navies have. Who, if anyone, do you see as as sort of the closest peer naval force that that you say that looks a little bit like us? They operate a little bit like us. Is there anyone, or do you occupy just a, a really unique niche that that of course allows you in many ways to be the the single most important uh, naval partner of, of the United States and certainly of, of great value to other partners? 
So the Navy, the Navy closest to us in that kind of peer style is also geographically our closest as well, which is the French Navy. Mm -hmm. um, but to say that <laughs> we've always been the closest of allies would be a quite slight misreading of history. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and I think it's fair to say that on a number of occasions in the last few hundred years, we've, we've resolved our differences at sea by the use of cannons. Um, Admiral <laughs> Pierre Bondier, uh, the head of the French Navy today, um, wrote, wrote to me when I was appointed the most delightful letter in which he reflected a thousand years of shared history, um, <laughs> the majority of which has been more peaceful than less. Uh, and they are very definitely, you know, across Europe, uh, we are. We are the closest in capabilities because we're the only two navies that operate nuclear submarines, both of which obviously, both of us obviously operate also from that uh, nuclear weapons um, or carry nuclear weapons on behalf of the nation. There are other navies in, you know, the Italians are, you know, are, are, re, re, or are building their F-35 capable carrier force as well. But but actually, if you did the kind of the Venn diagram, who are we closest to? It's undoubtedly um, the French. But I think it's also fair to say that sometimes and and usefully we see the world through different perspectives, and in a constructive and collaborative sense, that then becomes very productive because it prevents groupthink. And and Pierre Bondier, and I'm sure the same will be with his uh, successor who who takes over at the end of this month. Uh, Nicolas Bourgeois, um, you know, we want to see that as a strength that, that we can have, you know, really creative conversations about how we do things together well and better, but recognizing that our constructs are, for very understandable reasons, you know, and, um, you know, slight, slightly different. But we need to turn that into a partnership rather than, you know, some of the kind of challenges we've done in the past. So I see that. That's that's really important to us. And actually, when you then look further afield, there are a number of other navies where we've got very similar um, kind of scales or you know approach. So you know we're doing increasingly more with the Japanese Navy, um, mm -hmm. who are getting used to you know their 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 order of battle is extremely modern. It's well invested in. Their, their kind of technical understanding is is really profound. There's a lot of opportunity, but and and in many ways, for you know, over the last few hundred years, we've had a really quite close relationship by dint of by dint of history. They're beginning to find their kind of more regional and global capabilities and operational. So there's a lot that we can learn and share with with them. And, and then clearly, there's kind of the Australia, Canada, New Zealand through the Five Eyes partnership, which also is the you know, the straight historic linkages. But I think it would be a mistake to presume that just because um, all five, all four of those, you know, Australia, New Zealand, ourselves all share the same monarch and very considerable history that our navies are in the same place. That's that's not the sense, because each, each occupies a different geographical position, each responds to different geopolitical pressures. Um, the trick for us all is to is to double down and invest and magnify in the strengths that partnership and collaboration bring and look for those areas where by doing things to, together, we, we, we can do them better. Um, but that would be it. You know, I admire the way the Indian Navy is growing at the moment. I admire hugely what the Brazilians are doing. Um, you know, the head of the Colombian Navy has got great ambition to grow. We've got long partnerships with the Chilean. So, you know, I can't help but recognize that through our, through our history, a number of our admirals have been, you know, sometimes the ones that have been kicked out of the UK have then gone on to have very successful careers in other navies around the world. <laughs> and, um, you know, that that has given us kind of a historic, historically bounded network that we don't take for granted, but the, the shared narrative can be quite profound. Well, it's actually a perfect segue in into the Pacific. And let me actually start um, not with a gotcha question, but but just for the the sake of role playing, as if this were you know a, a parliamentary hearing uh, from someone who uh, represents a you know a constituency that's that's inland that 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 doesn't think about the world much necessarily. 
and asks, you know, asks you rather bluntly. I mean, I, we understand you know, you don't make policy, but you know, you represent the Navy, obviously. You know, um, what what interest does the Royal Navy, or for that matter, Britain more broadly, have in Asia? Why? Why you're as you mentioned, your core area is the Euro Atlantic. You're a European nation or an Atlantic nation. We have a special relationship between the U.S. and Britain. All that makes sense. Why should you ever be so far afield as in the Pacific? And what do you get out of it? And maybe that's a way to get into what you do do and where you might be going. And then we'll get more specific. So the, you know, the Indo-Asia Pacific region is the fastest growing econ- economic region of the world. Forty percent of our economic interests are already bound up with the region. So the idea that in some sense we would have an economic uh, partnership relationship with this piece, you know, with that part of the world, and then not tie that in with the other uh, uh, arms of national influence and power uh, would seem to me to be an incomplete solution. And if you then look at those, what are those aspects of a kind of national framework that then brings in the diplomatic, you know, the economic, the trade, uh, but also the security aspect. And we're very much part of that security piece. And when you consider just how much of the trade that flows in the Indo-Asia Pacific region goes by sea or by undersea cable, uh, when one looks at data movements, then for us to not want to play a part in ensuring some of that freedom of movement, you know, security for all that should pass upon the high seas, to, to quote a long-established piece, um, would seem to me to be both slightly bizarre in terms of why wouldn't we want to use that to reflect some of the kind of alliances and partnerships and, and relationships, uh, but also actually as part of an obligation. We shouldn't assume that only the Indo-Asia Pacific regions will, will look after our trade. We've got to play that, that part as well. Now, the preponderance of our effort will always keep us in the Euro-Atlantic because that's the kind of geophysical nature. But the globally connected, the globally collected characteristics of what are going on in the world now mean that in 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 that sense you can't keep it all at range. And I think there are many examples through through the last through the history of the last 150 years or so where nations have tried to to keep stuff at range, and and that has proved to be an impossible long term policy position. And I don't say that as a reflection upon uh, arguments going on in the US, at, you know, in the last 10 years, it's, it, you know, it, it is true of, of the world today, I think that it is very difficult to be isolated from the rest of the world, um, regardless of, you know, whether or not you happen to be uh, sharing most of your, your, you know, most collected and connected things to say, you know, Northern European countries like Norway, Sweden and Finland, who we see much more of than we you know, might necessarily, you know, Malaysia or Indonesia, but but that's not an, you can't be exclusive about that. So, so then working from that and, 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 you know, the, the really interesting way that you laid out, this is an element of, of all national power and national interest and in you're tying it to trade. What specifically then from the Royal Navy's perspective in terms of the Indo-Pacific or as, as you termed it, the Indo-Asia Pacific, um, if you could come up with a hierarchy of interests, meaning that these are the most critical things that we have to do, and then we flow downwards, and and ultimately that may then be you know just upholding general norms of of you know freedom of the seas. What would that hierarchy of 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 specific Royal Navy interests look like from your desk? I think the most the most important thing we can do is demonstrate to uh, the nations across the region. Uh, that they matter to us, hmm. and we're doing that as part of a national endeavor. You know, we're not we're not doing that alone. But if I look at the two offshore patrol vessels, the two sort of ninety meter, you know, corvettes that we've got in the region, HMS Bay and HMS Tamar, the fact that they are deployed to the region over five years, that they can go and visit a number of nations where we've not been for many years ourselves, and then revisit and start to say, okay, where can where can we help? Where can we contribute? Not not with the arrogance of turning up saying this is what you need to do but turning up and saying you know are there things that we can do to help have we got some skill sets or some insights from our own you know experiences some good some not so good you know are there areas where you know as a navy we can we can help invest in 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 those partnerships and alliances that's that's really important and also because you know we can kind of 
showcase uh, a, a British commitment into the region, whether that's in support of the regional ambassador or, or trade. And in, then in rebuilding that network and saying, look, this is what we, mat- you know, we matter, because the region is so vastly covered in ocean, it then allows us to start to play a part, a small part, alongside the other navies in the world. And you know, some of the really big challenges, transnational crime, illegal fishing, um, you know, security, seabed security. We're not going to solve it on our own, but showing the willingness, we are showing a willingness to be part of the solution space. And that actually the kind of the, the international system, the rule set that apply there, and that we kind of extol very clearly as the United Kingdom and, and are committed to, that we're prepared to put in put in some effort into in, you know around the world to to engage on that. And that seems to be seems to me to be the most you know the most important thing and and then second after that is because you can't predict how the future will go also is to demonstrate that we can also deploy hard power into the region that is not to preempt or to predict you know or to sort of um to say that we know that something is going to happen but to indicate that we we have an ability should the Government of the day, should the events of the day and all the rest of it require that, you know, the United Kingdom will commit into maintaining uh, peace and security, that we're prepared to do that. And, you know, we've always, you know, we have a tradition in the United Kingdom of being willing to, uh, you know, to commit alongside our friends. Well, you have to, you kind of have to be, if you're going to have that narrative, then you've got to rehearse and practice it. And and I think those kind of, um, those those elements and showing that we have a competent capability that is genuinely globally uh, globally capable is an is the second second part of the narrative. Can I ask actually one thing that Americans? I mean, we we've, we've talked about it on this podcast, but Americans don't often uh, remember or maybe don't even know is, of course, you do have territory in in the region and you have the Commonwealth. And how important are those? And and as you're talking about them, could you also talk a little bit about? Um, what may happen with Diego Garcia and, and cause that's a critical node for, for us and for you. Um, but maybe you could start just by, I mean, you do have territory. It's not that you don't have passport holders and citizens out there and the British, uh, oversee, well, Indian ocean territory Bayat, which is Diego Garcia, but also the Commonwealth. How does that figure into or factor into your, uh, your hierarchy of interests? We, we clearly have uh, some overseas territories and dependencies uh, across the region, and we need to you know, ensure that we're playing our part as you know, one part of the kind of the, 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 the British linkage. And, um, you know, the, the offshore patrol vessels have been very useful actually recently in visiting some of the more isolated ones in the Pacific and delivering stores and capabilities. And in one case, we actually took a dentist to one of the isolated islands so they could do some sort of basic, you know, post-COVID um, Healthcare, so those those sorts of things are are part of being kind of um, part of being part of that sort of broader government effort. The Commonwealth is a phenomenal organisation, um, and if you think about it, the kind of because its roots were in the British Empire. The British Empire, um, through all the night, was 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 founded on the need to. On, on a trading basis, but clearly empire is a very difficult concept in many ways. You know, some of the history associated with empire is far from great. And yet in the way that the British empire came to an end, out of it was born this commonwealth, you know, this sort of organization of partnership of nations. And, and whilst one could argue about whether, you know, just how effective it is or not, what it does do is it creates partnerships and alliances where, where it gives us opportunity. and. Providing we, we and you can, I'm really clear to all of my, to all of my teams. You know, we we've got to be humble in how we approach these relationships. We're not, you know, we're not we're not masters of anything out out in the Indo Pacific. In many ways, we're the we're the guest, but we do have history in the region. We do have long term relationships, often founded or sort of built through quite, you know, unusual lenses. So, you know, part of the relationship with Fiji is. Is through rugby, <laughs> you know the sort of. So it's, it's through through sport, and actually, if you want to create a relationship with a Fijian, you know, talking rugby for the first twenty minutes is a really good way of 
getting a dialogue going alongside kind of understanding. Well, we finally we finally have rugby in DC now. We've got a rugby league, so hopefully you'll be able to take in a game when you come and visit. It, it's a it's a fantastic it's a fantastic game. Um, so you get those kind of things which build on the Commonwealth network, but but as we've seen, you know, the Commonwealth is a kind of a voluntary organisation. Countries do you know are not obligated to stay. You know, in many ways, there are many people who say that the Commonwealth is its strength, daily strength was you know her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. But I think what we've seen since her her death last year is actually it has continued and it, it will remain a, a, a strength, I think, going into the future. In terms of some of the independent, I mean, clearly there are um, uh, there are challenges uh, in in a lot of areas around some of these uh, territories. You know, one of our one of our, you know the most, and I know it's not in the Indo Pacific, but you know the Argentinians continue to you know lay significant claim to the Falkland Islands, um, and and there is clearly ongoing dialogue um, around the British Indian Overseas Territories, um, you know, otherwise known as the Diego Garcia and the Chagos Islanders, and that you know, and that particular position. And I wouldn't want to preempt where that will end up. I'm just pleased that there is ongoing dialogue uh, because we we recognise that actually these islands have significance uh, that we want to continue to invest in uh, and and sustain, and that's very much our government position. But we're not. Um, we're not close to the fact that there are others who feel that they should also have some sort of right to the right to the islands. Um, and there is, you know, there is a matter of significant political and diplomatic uh, dialogue at the moment, sure. uh, which is um, not something I would want to preempt how that how that will land. Well, I understand. Sometimes I just point out the third rails. We definitely don't anticipate that you're going to grab them with both hands. So no. <laughs> No, no pressure there, but maybe we could talk about another uh, intensive uh, diplomatic and and military initiative, which is AUKUS, uh, which is uh, a new and and uh, you know very innovative and uh, approach to security collaboration, uh, and yet also one that has um, challenges associated with it because quite rightly because of how ambitious it is. Um, can you talk a little bit about AUKUS and, and where you, you've you sat now in, in the chair for a little while? And, and so thinking about um, how we've gone through the first 18 months, how we go forward on it, uh, any worries you might have on it or things you'd want an American audience to know that you know, you're keeping an eye on, what, where, where does it stand from your perspective? So I think AUKUS is one of the most profound um, trilateral agreements that has been reached in a security sense, uh, and and probably more broadly, but particularly, I think, for many decades, you know, at its heart, or it, its founding thing was the transfer of uh, nuclear propulsion technology uh, from from one nation to another. And the last time the United States did that, of course, was with us in, as a result of the 1958 agreement. So these things do not come around very often. And one of the things that I am very, very aware of and has been for the last few years, and I'm not a submariner by background, so it's really only when I've got into senior position, is, is what it is just how seriously the United States takes its obligations to the United Kingdom under the mutual defense agreement and and that stewardship of nuclear propulsion technology and and now uh, the australians are being brought in to this to turn it into a three way uh uh you know a three way partnership no one underestimates just how challenging that is going to be not just over the next few years but over the next 20 30 40 years i mean this is a multi decade um, commitment, a deeply profound for the Australians, who you know it's not that long ago um, that they wouldn't even allow nuclear-powered warships from other nations into their or you know in, into their waters. So very profound for Australia. I think very strategic. The whole process they went through in order to you know to, to un undertake the analysis that led to the conclusions that they needed to shift to nuclear uh, nuclear powered submarines in order to consider their security and the whole nature of their their kind of um, strategic review uh, that took place um, and provided that kind of conceptual um, uh, conceptual framework uh, 
I, I really admire because it is a huge commitment. The challenge is that somehow you need to take two nations that have considerable nuclear capabilities, but which are also um, not full of spare capacity. And, and, and the image I'd like to give your, uh, to the listeners of the podcast is if you can imagine you know, a very large bucket, which is called United States Nuclear Submarine Capability, which into which you can put industry as well as as the navy, as well as you know nuclear reactors and all of that, um, and that's that's full to the brim with stuff and it's busy. And then you've got a smaller bucket which is the the UK's equivalent, and then you've got an Australian bucket which is currently empty, and somehow we have to fill the Australian bucket without emptying the UK or the US ones, because the the simplistic one, if you ever wanted to do that, was to take our two buckets and swap a bit into the Australian one and kind of even it all out. But actually, that's that's not an option when there are uh, the role of those, the reason why you have this nuclear submarine technology is for fundamental security issues for our two nations. And, and for the United Kingdom, you know, our deterrent is... Um, is is allocated to NATO. Uh, the nuclear submarines that we have have roles of their own, and we cannot say. And and in each country, we are going through major recapitalization programs as we build new submarines to replace the older classes as they come out. So, whilst, as if that wasn't enough, we now need to help Australia uh, develop its own capabilities. And as you'll be aware, that's a kind of yeah. You know, as the the leaders announced. Um, earlier this year when the three leaders met in San Diego, which I was uh, privileged enough to be there alongside um, Admiral Mike Gilday, the head of the US Navy, and, and Admiral Mark Hammond, the head of the Australian Navy. You know, there was this kind of phased approach where phase one is to see more uh, US and UK nuclear submarines operating um, uh, out of Australia. The second is for the Australians to operate Virginia class, uh, American Virginia class under their own flag, and then the third is the is the building along with the United Kingdom of what has become known as SSN AUKUS, and that is that is multi decade commitment. Um, so that is to pretend that that's not going to be a massive challenge is is to miss the point. But the strategic opportunity is really really great, and that is where I think AUKUS has is is the kind of visionary thing that it's become in pillar one because it's committed three nations to something which the outcome of which is is the ability to contribute to a globally operated uh, nuclear submarine force with everything that that can offer into the security framework of the world as well as uh, driving greater resilience and prosperity and economic benefit into the supply chains that support it clearly AUKUS but AUKUS isn't just about although the headline is around uh, nuclear submarine propulsion technology. Um, the Pillar 2 work is also looking at a number of other areas where uh, investment can be made, electronic warfare, hypersonics would be a couple of the areas that have been mentioned and a number of others. And of course, that, that then leads us to a mindset about how we're going to operate together, mutually support each other, uh, what are the things we want to do together. And I think it's very interesting to me to see how other nations in the Indo-Pacific region have responded to AUKUS, where clearly they have had to respect their own, you know, national sensitivities and all the rest of it. But in the main, it has been broadly welcomed as a positive contribution. And, and I think that is, is a really important recognition of what this framework is going to offer us in the longer run. So that's actually a great Point and and I appreciate the the um, the detail in which you talked about AUKUS and 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 why it makes sense. But it's but your last comments are a great point to um, ask just a couple more questions before we wrap up about some of those other nations. And while there are many nations we could talk about, I'd like to single out two: Japan and China, and ask the Royal Navy's uh, perspective about the partnership that's been developing uh, with Japan and and. Is it valuable? Why? Why do you want it to continue? Do you want it to continue? And and if so, where could it go? Uh, and then you can't, you know, have a podcast on Asia without talking about China. So maybe you could talk about Japan first a little bit, and then we'll we'll shift over to China and, and try to get again the, the the view from the bridge on you know what you face in terms of dealing with China. But Japan first. Another one, by the way, with you, you've had some 
interesting history in in the past and and it's it's actually in as a you know a historian who started by working on Japan and Japan in the world you know it it is how would i put this it is it is wonderful it's a blessing it's a privilege to live in a time where we don't have to deal with so many of the problems that our two countries dealt with for generations. Uh, we get to talk about it in a totally different manner. So maybe you could talk a little bit about Japan from that perspective. So a few years ago, I met a previous head of the Japanese Navy at a, um, uh, at a fleet review in India. And this was just at the time, I think, under uh, uh, the, the, the late Prime Minister Abe, where they were really beginning to open up again and think about kind of becoming more globally engaged in a military sense and he said to me look the royal navy and the japanese navy have have a history stretching over uh several hundred years and we have operated together you know much of the royal the japanese navy's construct was was taken from the way that the royal navy's approach he said and then we've had a he said, and then we had a difficult period, which has lasted for a few decades in the middle of the last century. He said, but I want to look, I want, he, his point was, we've moved beyond that now. And what I want to do is to get back to how it used to be, because that actually is how we're going to define the future. And he didn't mean that in a kind of, it, it's not as good as it used to be. Can we go back? What he said was, that's the level of partnership we should be aspiring for. And, and I thought that was a really interesting and positive comment because how can you ignore not 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 ignore when you've got a country of japan's size its economic heft the way that the japanese navy has been developing they've got to be a key regional partner if we're going to engage in that part of the world and and so there is clearly so much that we can start to to do together you know much more closely and you know i'll be delighted that actually you know this this month my Japanese opposite number is coming over to, to London and Portsmouth to spend some time um, talking about how we can to invest in all of that. So great. And Japan matters to the United Kingdom, you know, across a whole range, not just in an economic basis, but I look at the global combat aircraft program, which, you know, UK and Japan have set up. If that's not, I mean, that might not have quite the kind of the nuclear aspect associated with it, but it's still a multi-decade program investing in, you know, modern technologies that will develop new the new, next generation of fighter aircraft, both crewed and uncrewed. You know, that is a really profound partnership as well. And so Japan, it, it, as I said, I think I used the phrase at the beginning, it would be, be bizarre for us not wanting a cl as close a partnership as possible with, with Japan because of what it represents. You know, it's a member of the Quad. Um, and and so it's, it, it brings heft and perspective uh, that that seems to us to be really important. So um, uh, that's that. You know, I, I see them as a as a key partner, just as in the same way. And you didn't ask me about it, but you know, the Republic of Korea Navy is also someone that we would wish to, um, uh, you know, have as close a tie with as we as as we can. They're at different stages of their development, but mm -hmm. you know, it's also an important regional security partner. And then and then China and and I think, you know, we're 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 really clear what. What, what we want is a productive relationship with China, but that doesn't come all on Chinese terms. You know, and, and I think at its heart, this is, this is what we would, we would, I, you know, I, I, I look at the way that, you know, China is developing its Navy and is clearly developing some uh, key capabilities. And um, President Xi has made no secret of his ambition for, um, you know, for that kind of what he expects to see out of the, PLA Navy and 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 elsewhere, um, we don't we're not framing them in in, adver in adversarial terms, but they need to recognise that there are a number of other people around the world, you know, and nations who have got views and who have got setups and you know have who have absolutely the fundamental right enshrined in the United Nations Charter to go about their business with 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 freedom and choice, and providing that that's how China wishes to to respond to. Um, and the way that the Chinese Navy wants to act at sea and all the rest of it, then, then I'm very happy to work alongside them. But they need to understand that this is not a, um, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a relationship that needs to be done on the basis of mutual respect and equality uh, and, and not some of the kind of more uh, bellicose language um, and, and, and threatening language that we've heard in the past.
have you been able to work with them? So I would refer back. I mean, I, I remember back in 2014, I think it was, we had a delegation of senior Chinese uh, admirals who ran the, the Chinese Navy education process, came over and we for two days to see how we did training and education um, in the Royal Navy. And there were some very productive conversations. You know, you could actually talk about those areas where investing in human capital and making the most of the potential of the young men and women that join our respective services was a really interesting, really interesting dialogue. The first Sea Lord of the day, Admiral Zambellis, you know, visited China and was able to have similar conversations with his his opposite number. So we've done this in the past. We know we can do it and we want to do it again in the in the future, but it needs to be done, as I said, on 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 the basis of of mutual respect. So, Admiral Key, before we let you go, um, I just thought of a I just thought of a wrap up question. Now, uh, had a lot of uh, Air Force officers on the on the program at at, at different times, or at least a, a couple, uh, or I've met a lot of Air Force officers certainly in you know working in DC. And I always ask them one question. I always ask them, you know, if you if you could fly any fighter jet throughout history, what would you have chosen? And 99% of them all say the same jet, which is the, the P-51 Mustang. But we have the head of a Navy here, one of the great navies of the world, one of the greatest in world history. So first Sea Lord, let me ask you, if you could have sailed on or better commanded any warship in history, any time, any country, any place, which warship would it have been? <laughs> oh, that is a really unfair question because and the reason why I'm going to slightly dodge it, well, I think, is because, of course, the thing about the aeroplane was that that was just the pilot in the aeroplane, whereas a warship requires you to go to sea with several hundred other people. It's, in a, it's, you know, it's a community sense. And so actually some of that, but if you wanted a set of sense of excitement to be part of something that felt different, I right. suppose you would look for one of those moments which were generational changing. So for me, it would be right. the sort of ships like um, HMS Dreadnought, the first of the, the new battleships that was kind of a paradigm changer that came out in the early 20th century. I mean, I'm sure there were bits of technology about it that were frankly awful. Mm. Um, but it represented a real conceptual shift. And you, the people that were on board serving in oh. those ships at the time knew they were going through something very, very different. Actually, um, the same could probably say, be said of the um, ships like the pocket, the German pocket battle cruisers of the Second World War, the Graf Spey, uh, the, um, the Tirpitz. You know, very fast, very agile, designed to operate on their own. You know, some phenomenal technology in them. Yes, they were on the other side, and we were very glad when they sank. But they represented, you know, they represented something really quite profound in thinking. You know, generational shifts. And then, of course, you know, the next generational shift for us was was was, was into the aircraft carrier, and I was lucky enough to command, albeit a smaller one than today's generation, um, <laughs> one of those. So I think. At those moments, you would go for those moments when you've got a kind of a technology shift. And of course, the thing I'm saying, that I'm, you know, that we someone's going, well, he hasn't mentioned HMS Victory. I haven't mentioned HMS Victory. You know, there's all the history in the world there, and that would just be presumptuous um, if I was to talk about what she was. You know, she was one of the finest battleships of her day, and full of technology that was very applicable to them. Except a lot of that technology was in the use of wood and sail rather than in the use of metal, steam. And and now you know gas gas turbine nuclear tech you know nuclear propulsion technology. So yeah, that's a bit of a hedgy question, a hedgy answer to a, actually a very good question. <laughs> well, I've never asked it before, but actually, it, it's actually a fascinating answer that you gave. Not one I I expected, but actually one that I think perfectly reflects the um the challenges that you and your and your peers face because we are at a transitional period we're at a transitional period with autonomous technology we're at a transitional period uh in terms of um other nations now uh, coming up to the level of capabilities that we've had for so long that we take them for granted and i'm really actually fascinated that you you put it that way and i'm glad you put it that way but i think the very fact that you put it that way 
reveals how important this moment is uh, because it will set the tenor for the next generation or two generations of fighting on the sea and patrolling on the sea as well as in the air and on the land. And that's, and actually <laughs> you are reflecting something I say to my own team that if you, if you track through, um, you know, navies used to propel themselves by ore. That was, that was the principal way. And then they recognized that was quite limiting. So you kind of, you know, the Peloponnesian wars were fought at sea by city states, but that was about paying people to row. Then they moved and they found a way of, you know, say, say you know, sailing ships were developed, mm -hmm. which became ever faster, greater acreage of sail, uh, sleeker hulls, but you've also got to balance the kind of fire firepower that goes into them. And to show how wedded people were, you know, the early ships on all around the world that started to have engines didn't get rid of their masts and sails. And um, and Jackie Fisher, my predecessor, who was caught up in the dreadnought, actually, that although he's most known for the dreadnought. The thing that he really did was he said to the Navy, we're out of sail and we're out of coal. Oil is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that he profoundly changed was the kind of um, a lot of the personnel structures within the Navy to move away from a very hierarchical, and I don't mean officer and rating, but you either warfare, you know, if you're an engineer, you were lower, you were from a, right. you know, a kind of, you wore colored, stripes between your gold stripes to demonstrate you weren't quite a proper naval officer you were an engineer actually he said no remove all of that color my grandfather was one of those early ones because that was a recognition we are a technical service that is moving to a different way of thinking and we're going through another one of those now which is around a digital so we become a navy that has to be digital mm -hmm. so this isn't a, a change of shift around propulsion now this is a change of shift around the way that we are going to engage and fight and operate in an autonomous, semi-autonomous, fully crewed, talk it how you will, but the foundation of what maritime power or naval power feels like now is, is going to be profoundly different over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years than it was through the 20th century. So it does feel to me like one of those kind of dreadnought moments um, that we're, we're, we're living in. Uh, and that is extraordinarily exciting. And it's something that, uh, frankly, we will only do if we do it with our partners and allies around the world because of the nature of the connected planet in which we live. Well, that is a, uh, a wonderfully upbeat note on which to end. We don't always get that on this podcast. Often it's a, it's a sort of semi-somber or fully somber note, but, but it's nice to have um, uh, to end on, on vision and, and a thought of what we can do together and where we're going. And so Admiral Ben Key, first Sea Lord of the Royal Navy, Thank you so much for joining us on the Pacific Century. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me your time. Well, for the Pacific Century podcast, I'm Misha Oslin. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we generate and promote ideas advancing freedom. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.